Hey everyone, Genome here, coming at you with my next episode in my interview series where I talk to people who do interesting and or extraordinary things. And um, today's interview has a real special meaning to me because um, it really ties into something I've been working with. Uh, for those of you who know my channel knows I delve deeply into nostalgia, especially stuff from the 80s when I was growing up. So as of recently, I have been re-reviewing the Friday the 13th series in its entirety and putting very long-winded videos up on uh, the internet for those to peruse. So in doing so, I decided to reach out to some of the creators of said franchise and uh, had a gentleman who was kind enough to get back to me and allot me a little bit of time to talk to him. Uh, that's none other than Tom McLaughlin, a director and writer of Friday the 13th Part 6. So Tom, great to have you. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh -huh. Uh, or a lot, however much you want to give me. It's been a lot, uh, but I'll, I'll see if I can, you know, kind of give you some, uh, you know, as I say, cliff notes. Um, I was born and raised here in, in Los Angeles um, and grew up with a father who was a USC film student. So I immediately got a great love and passion for, you know, the films that, that obviously he loved. Uh, and I grew up across the street from the MGM Studios, the old MGM Studios, where there was backlots. So on the weekends, me and my friends would take our little 8 millimeter camera and sneak under the fence and actually shoot movies when we were seven, eight years old. And we were shooting on backlots, so it looked incredible. Of course, we were terrible, but <laughs> you know, it looked nice behind us. Um, so that was, you know, kind of the passion that, that first started with me of, of loving, loving film. And um, then I, my dad was also a magician, and so I learned how to do magic, so that had a you know, great effect on things I did later on. Uh, the Beatles hit, the Rolling Stones hit, all these groups that suddenly changed my mind about you know, who I was gonna be, I wanted to be a rock star. So I uh, grew my hair out, which I still am doing to this day, uh, and got kicked out of about seven high schools because you couldn't have long hair you know, in, in the mid-60s. Uh, meant you were communist or something. They couldn't figure us out. But uh, I hung on to the rock dream, and uh, we we opened for the Doors, Iron Butterfly, a number of these you know major groups, uh, Pink Floyd, uh, Love. It was an incredible time to be a teenager on the Sunset Strip uh, with the whiskey and seeing Led Zeppelin for the first time live, and the Cream and Jimi Hendrix went to Monterey Pop. So I mean, I was just like totally you know inundated inundated with, with nothing but rock and roll. Well, then things started to get ugly here in Los Angeles. The Manson, you know, murders happened. Uh, Jimmy died, Janice died, um, Morrison died, and it was sort of like, what's what's going on with the scene? And I wanted to be a better lead singer, a more physical lead singer, so I went off to Paris in 19 uh, to study mine with Marcel Marceau. And then that became my career of, you know, doing physical comedy. And that led to meetings with Woody Allen. So I worked on Sleeper and uh, Disney with the Black Hole and anything that required like physical stuff, like you know, robots, humanoids, monsters. I was the monster in Prophecy, John Frankenheimer movie. And all that time, I wanted to get back to writing and directing because I obviously, you know, the film world was getting to me. And finally, I got an opportunity in uh, 1980 to write and direct uh, One Dark Night, which is my first movie. And then somehow I turned around uh, and after having a book uh, that Joe Baudry did, called The Strange Idea of Entertainment on me, I realized, geez, I made 42 films. I, I, you, know, I, you know, television films, cable films, you know, feature films, all of that. And that sort of put me in this, okay, what do I do now? And the band got back together. You know, we're all in our 60s doing the 60s rock, doing it as hard and passionately as we did, you know, when as teenagers, even more so now because the clock's ticking on us. The Reaper's not that far away, but we're kind of going for the dream that we had you when know, we were teenagers. So that, going back to writing and, um, you know, working on trying to get the next directing thing, as well as teaching uh, film at uh, Chapman University, you know, kind of is where my life is today. Well, you know, you're pretty safe from the Grim Reaper. He doesn't touch old rock stars now. I mean, Mc McCartney and Jagger are still going strong. So, <laughs> but um, all right. So, so you you may kind of made the transition of jumping from in front of the camera to behind the camera. Was that like a gradual process, or is that something that 
you was like, you know what, it's 1978, whatever, I'm not going to make it uh, in front of the camera, maybe I should get behind the camera. What was the rationale for wanting to get behind the camera so badly? I really, well, again, going back to it as a kid, that love of making movies. Um, so I was in front of the camera more as a way to have a job that would be on the set with people. So I could actually ask the sound people, you know, what, what it is that they do, how they do it, you know, be around the you know, cameraman, obviously, you know, go into editing. So I learned so much in that process, but anytime, you know, they would ask me, you know, oh, so this is what you want to do, be a monster in movies and stuff, I'm like, no, no, I really want to direct. And it's like, yeah, right, I have a bear suit wants to direct. And so I, you know, I, I just hung in there um, until I finally found the script um, or an idea for a script that I was passionate about, and it was in the era of the slasher movies uh, yeah, in the 70s and 80s, so it was very hard to get something that was a non-slasher movie made, and because I was doing kind of a bloodless gothic horror movie with crypts and corpses and all that, um, but eventually that's, that's kind of what, you know, what happened, and then, that, then I had a colleague card, I could take that script on that those film cans around and, and show people that I could direct. Yeah, I saw, I was uh, recently, I actually watched One Dark Night, and uh, there's a lot of pretty cool stuff on, or, or, if you had one word to describe that movie, how would you describe it? One Dark Night? Mm-hmm. I guess the thing that, you know, gothic horror, that's two words, but... Gothic horror, okay, uh, goth horror, yeah, we just got like that, right? I, you know, the influences really were the universal, you know, horror movies, those sets, that that feeling, and probably even more so um, the Roger Corman movies, mm -hmm. the uh, Poe movies, very much going into that, but, you know, the, the big influence was when I was in Paris, I went down into the catacombs, and to walk those tunnels with wall-to-wall -wall bones and skulls really gave me a sense of supernatural fear. Like, there's nothing here, there's nothing to jump out at me, but you just know these are all deceased people, and, and you could just feel this strange vibe, and that was what sort of was the influence to go and, you know, do a, a movie inside of a mausoleum. Yeah, it was, it was an interesting premise there, and um, uh, I noticed at the very beginning, and no one else had, had mentioned this, that you, uh, uh, your best friend, is it Stephen Hawes is your best friend? I'm sorry, uh, Michael, Hawes. Michael Hawes, I always want to call him Stephen. Yeah. I noticed you stuck a headstone that said Hawes out front. I got, you know, a Stephen and a Michael in my life. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I noticed you stuck a gravestone and said Hawes out front, so you've worked him in two yeah. of your movies at least, right? So, yeah. <laughs> at least in name, so that's interesting. All right, so uh, you did that movie on, what, about a million dollar budget or so? For One Dark Night? Mm -hmm. Yeah, One Dark Night, they, they originally told us they had a million dollars. This was a, uh, a Mormon investment company that needed to lose a million dollars mm -hmm. by the end of the year. So we were the sort of the tax, you know, thing that, that they, they needed to sort of make it and then declare bankruptcy and that's it. But as we started making the movie, the budget kept going down and down, and I think we ended up with about 800000 Gotcha, gotcha. Now we'll get a little more into Friday the Thirteenth later on. I'm sure a lot of people want to hear about that, but I'm sure you might be sick to death of maybe always talking about it. But um, no. no, I see. Look at that. A good artist likes his creation. Some people look back on their older stuff and they can't stand <laughs> looking at it anymore. But uh, I well, mean, there was, if, there was a period I uh, literally I had to take it off my resume because the kind of jobs I was getting were like family drama, Christmas movies, mm -hmm. um, you know, true crime things, which you know, all of this stuff. You know, they saw on my resume. You know, Friday the 13th, and they go, oh, we don't want a slasher guy in here. And I go, would you just look at the movie? I tried to make a, a movie movie with this thing and not just, you know, a, you know, a, a counting of teenagers getting killed after they have sex. So, you know, but I had to take it away so that I could do, you know, a Hallmark Hall of Fame movie and some of these things because I really wanted to expand as a filmmaker. And I love directing actors. I love the whole psychological thing that, you know, you do with, with creating something that, that, that doesn't exist. In other words, a character that the actors, it's not them and it's not what's on the page. It's just something that kind of comes together in the chemistry. And, it, you know, it, it's an amazing, it's, it's an amazing craft, you know, and, and I just love doing a lot of different genres, which television allowed me to do. Now, speaking of typecasting, uh, a lot of people probably don't know this, but Adam West was actually in One Dark Night. And wasn't one of the reasons you cast him is because he was having trouble finding work? Totally. It mm -hmm. was, that was it. It was like my the rebellious side of me when the casting uh, you know, director said, well, you know, they submitted Adam West. I said, really? And he goes, yeah, but nobody wants to hire him because he's, he's Batman. 
And I go, well, fuck that. No, I, you know, I, I'd love to give Batman a job. And, you know, the, the flip side of that was, is that, you know, part of the, the thing with Adam is that he got so in love with that speaking up here and then bringing the voice down here and then bringing it up and down because that's what we do, Robin. We do. And I had to take that away from him some way, somehow, you know, in the directing, uh, trying to get him just to say the lines flat. And, it, you know, I basically had that in my original cut. And then the, the film was taken away from us by this, somebody who took over the company and they brought him in for looping and he brought the, <laughs> some of those same up and down <laughs> with the line. So it is in the movie in places. Um, so it's it, it just one of the sort of ironic things when you hire somebody that, that is known for something and they're comfortable with that. Hmm. Well, but you still worked him in good and it was, it was good of you to think of him and give him that shot because I know it can be hard for people. I, I mean, well, anyway, we'll, we'll get about, like Lon Chaney, for example, if we're going to talk about uh, old horror movie icons, you know, like your type gas forever at that point. So, yeah, it's great uh, that you can think outside the box just a little bit, you know. And, but um, yeah. well, every, everybody, I mean, as you know, I mean, Sylvester Stallone, you know, he, he can be very funny. And I've seen him in roles that you go, you know, he's really good at that. But public wants Rocky and Rambo, you know, of course, now the uh, what's the one that he put together with, uh, with everybody. Oh, Expendables, I think it is. That's one you yeah. think. So you know they can continue to keep that those franchise going, you know, uh, up until we, he just can't do it any longer. But it is that same sort of typecasting thing, is that you know people love him in a certain way, and you kind of have to embrace that. Yeah, wasn't uh, wasn't Stallone in what was that Rhinestone Co Cowboy? I think it was, wasn't he in that with Dolly Parton or whatever? <laughs> that was, I think it was that, or was that John Travolta? I'm thinking about. I thought it was Sylvester Stallone though. Yeah, he, he, you know, there were there was a few things that he did that you know were just like action movies and stuff that you know he was good at, but his, they never were really big box office things for him. Yeah. Now, uh, getting back to some of your films, um, I've noticed in a lot of stuff that you've done, you you seem to employ a really active camera in your shoots. Is this something you really strive for, um, as opposed to more static shots in in your flicks? Yeah, I mean, I've always been in love with the moving camera and a lot of that comes from the influence of uh, Spielberg you know that he was the guy when we were you know coming up you know in the 70s that you know every one of his films was like uh oh, geez he's already made the best film we can't you know <laughs> we can't do a Jaws we can't do a Raiders you know I can't do a Close Encounters and he was influenced you know by David Lean and all the great you know directors who you know really did make things with the you know, with the camera and really, you know, gave you those three dimensions and, and had an energy and a way of telling the story with camera. So those influences and Scorsese, huge influence on me. You know, I tried to, you know, look at their work and then go, you know, what can I adapt that makes sense, you know, for these scenes that, that have some sense of movement, some sense of, you know, you, you are participating kind of in a voyeuristic way and not just, you know, like a static screenshot mm -hmm. of our state, you know, something to just stage for the frame. But, you know, when it's right, I'll do that. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's all about trying to take the tools and use them, you know, in, in different ways. See, I've noticed in my perusal again of the Friday the 13th movies, because, you know, back when I first watched them, I was a, I was a young, young and, and I didn't really care too much for uh, cinematography tricks and lighting and all that and, and character movements. I didn't care about that too much. But I've noticed of my favorite ones of the series so far have been yours and Steve Miners, and both of you guys seem to employ a lot of, like I said, different camera angles and nice, you know, active shots and good lighting and all that. So, yeah, it, it definitely brings so much more to the film. And uh, I don't. Uh, do you ever get a lot of flack from producers and all that saying, "Look, we, you could shoot this a lot faster if you wouldn't focus so much on this constant movement or whatever it is your dynamic camera angles." No, but there's never really too much of a complaint about that because you, you have to learn how to move fast on, on low budget. And then, of course, when I started doing these, these TV movies, I mean, you know, you had 16 to 18 days to do them. So you had to prove if you wanted to do that style, you could do it, you know, fast. And it's a question of, you know, having the right crew, particularly the right DP that doesn't get, you know, overwhelmed with what it is you want to do. He goes, okay, I can do that. Let's go. And then me planning the shots out in such a way that you know i know about how long it's going to take to do these so that you can kind of you know have a structure for the day um and many many times it doesn't really take that much more time um unless it's a really elaborate shot i got into trouble how much film i shot because in the days of shooting film 
I was shooting the way kind of people do, like with videotape today and digital, you know, you just keep rolling till you get the right performance. <laughs> and, you know, they hated that because that, that was costly in the film world. So I had to really try to, you know, figure out where, you know, it's like, okay, I'll give up a crown. <coughs> oh, boy. Somebody came in the door, so the dog takes off. Sorry. No problem. Um, but, um, yeah, that, that was the only thing that I kind of, you know, got my you know, hand slapped about was how much film I would shoot back then. Yeah, wasn't it, I think it was, was it Orson Welles or whoever or Sidney Sinkane, didn't he shoot like three million feet of film or some insane amount number? It was huge. Yeah, there, I, I, I don't know who, I don't know who has the record, but certainly there's a lot of people, you know, they talk about Michael Cimino and, you know, um, you know, Heaven's Gate, you know, going on and on and on and on for something that's eventually, you know, didn't work at all. Um, but there's, you know, Cleopatra, you know, the Elizabeth Taylor thing, that, that, that movie almost killed 20th Century Fox. I mean, they try to, you know, blame it on that. So, I mean, it's nothing new shooting, you know, too much stuff. But when you have a short amount of, of uh, days, you really have to go, all right, you know, how many shots can I get into this day? And, you know, and, and where are the ones that you're willing to uh, let go of, compromise with, you know, when it gets down to it in, in time? Now, we'll get a little uh, off track here because I like to bounce around quite a bit. Uh, we're going to kind of blend Hollywood and the music world a little bit because you are also a musician uh, as uh, lead singer of the Sloths, is, um, who have been, what, what's the word, reconstituted now? Uh, what's, what's, was it, uh, what's the new? Resurrected. Yeah, resurrected. Yeah. It's, it's very apropos, isn't it? But uh, yeah. So, yeah. okay, here's a question for you. The Monkees, were they good or bad for the music industry? Well, having auditioned for the Monkees, because um, that's I, we were an active band at that time, and literally when they first looked for the Monkees, they were looking for a group that was already together, that already you know already you know were musical, and yet you know they weren't finding the, you know the elements that they wanted, so they put together you know with different individuals. Um, you know, it was it was a it was a time where obviously the Beatles, you know, were so popular, and television was trying to find some way of doing that and doing it with comedy and cute and something for the you know teen boppers at that time. And you know, I, you know, I didn't dislike it. In fact, you know, I I found it sort of fun, and some of the songs were you know wonderful or classics today. So uh, yeah, that was you know, a, a, you know, another kind of you know, the pop aspect of, of rock and roll coming out of this town i found it fascinating I, i've been researching them a little more lately and just uh I, I just what a brilliant i think it's a brilliant idea what they did you know you take what's working overseas and what's working on radio and you throw it on tv and make you create your own super group i think it's just brilliant um uh, but uh, i don't know that's been floating around my head here for a couple of weeks to ask but uh yeah you know it's a shame about them uh being so musically limited, like by the by the studios and all that, they weren't really allowed to play most of their own instruments and all that. But they were all actually musicians. A lot of people don't know that about them. So yeah, yeah. I just saw them. I mean, I fortunately saw them. You know, everybody but Mike Nesbitt um, was in the group uh, not that long ago, about three years ago or so. And then we we lost Dave. Mm -hmm. and we lost Peter. Um, and then Mike rejoined. You know, and Mickey Dolenz is a great drummer, a great singer. I mean, all of them. You sit there and go, they were really you know terrific. So over the years, I mean, they've become, you know, a great group. Yeah, it was kind of funny how they put, like, it's fun, just for, like, optics, they put them in completely the wrong positions. Like, you know, Mickey had a great voice. He was actually the best drummer of the group. <laughs> but they didn't want Davey yeah. being the drummer because they couldn't see him back there because he was a little bit smaller guy. But just, just fascinating. Oh, anyway, yeah, it's enough about the monkeys. I'm sure people didn't tune in to hear about that. But uh, you, you have an interesting perspective on these things, being around at that time, you know, and being yeah, so immersed in that scene. Sort of Forrest Gump aspect of my life, you know, being in, in places where it suddenly it was something and you could feel something's going on, but you, you know, it took years later to look back and go, God, I can't believe I, I was in a room, you know, sitting there watching, you know, music at a, at a place where Jimi Hendrix had just done his music video and then to have him, you know, pass a, a, a joint to me and I take it and then going through this moment of going, do I smoke it? Do I pass it? Do I keep it? I mean, Jimi Hendrix just handed me this, you know, and I mean, stories like that were just, you know, I was, I don't know, 16, 17, I guess at that time, um, and it just was all sort of part of, you know, the purple haze of that period. Is, uh, is, is getting on stage kind of an infectious thing? Is it, is it, uh, is it uh, like a siren song that keeps calling you back? 
Yeah, it didn't. I mean, I would have, while I was a director, you know, doing all these shows, I wouldn't put cameos of myself in there. I mean, very, very rarely. And like when, when I did play a part, like, and sometimes they come back, I ended up cutting myself out, just going, you know, we don't need that scene. It's nice, but we don't need it. So there was no great ego about having to be up there. And as I said, I, I sort of had, you know, great fear of going back. But then, you know, when the band thing happened and I got back up on stage, it literally was like I never left. And it was this amazing euphoria of, wow, I'm, you know, we're back doing what we love to do. And the audiences, you know, there's everybody kind of has their own look, which are based on, you know, looks from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And, you know, sometimes I'm looking out there and it looks like the audience I was singing to, you know, in 1965. You know, when they're young and wearing their hair the way they did then, I mean, it, it, it's very surreal. All right. Well, speaking of surreal, I think it's about time we just jump into probably your most famous work here. Um, Friday 13th, Part 6, Jason Lives. So you not only directed, but you also wrote the story. Um, how long did you have to actually write the script for this movie? It went pretty fast. Um, the, 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 uh, the, well, first off, you know, after they did Part 5, usually it was two years between Friday films, but they felt like, oh my God, we've got to get the audience back. So they decided to green with this, you know, Friday six, um, right away to get it out literally a year later. So there was a fast track that was happening. And the Frank Mancuso Jr. saw my film, said, you know, we'd like you to do this, you know, uh, well, what kind of, you know, script would you like? You know, just, just bring back Jason figure out how to do it. And at, at that point, I had already written Date with an Angel, my next movie. And I, I was very much in my comedy, you know, mood at that time. And I said, I want to put humor in. Is that OK? And he said, yeah, just don't make fun of Jason. I said, no, no, he's still going to be a monster. But I just want the kids to be likable, witty. You know, I want to have a sense of irreverence, you know, about it, you know, touch of satire. And he goes, well, let's see what you come up with. So I went to the Hollywood Forever Cemetery, which is right next to Paramount you know, Studios and wrote this treatment and if anybody goes out there and buys that book that i mentioned earlier that joe madri did a strange idea of entertainment conversations with tom mclaughlin back of the book is that treatment uh for the friday the 13th uh at that time it was called jason has risen um and it was you know pretty much the script i mean it was weird that it all kind of came out you know pretty much the way i ended up in the script you know writing the script so all in all, you know, the process was, you know, maybe a month, you know, from the you know, treatment to having the final script and a shooting script. And the only thing that we, you know, really lost was the father. I was introducing Jason's father at the end of the movie, and Frank felt, you know, if the audience thinks the next movie is going to be about, you know, the dad of Jason, we can't do that. So that was, you know, taken out for that reason. I saw in the. Uh... See, so yeah, right here, the DVD special edition of the series, they actually put a storyboard um, with that little aspect on there, so that was kind of interesting. Actually, it was read by Bob Larkin, too, wasn't it, as I recall? Yeah. So that was a nice touch, too. Um, yeah. Now, you mentioned the producer um, kind of giving you a little bit of direction on what you can include for when it, when it came to Jason. I've, I've, I've read that in some, and seen in some of the previous movies that there have been some pretty heavy studio interference i mean there's a lot of tension on some of these sets because of it did you find you had any issues with that at all during this shoot i i was i have to say blessed in that frank trusted me um i trusted his you know instincts if he said something then you know i certainly listened but he said very little you know just like good this is going this is working so i really had you know pretty much total control in that regard um Frank would come down and say, well, we want to do a teaser, you know, and I said, well, what are you thinking? He goes, oh, we're just thinking about just having the camera, you know, move in on the crib, I'm sorry, on the coffin, and then it, you know, opens up and there's nothing in there, and it says, Jason, that's like, great. So, you know, I kind of stopped shooting, allowed him to shoot that thing, and then off he went again. Um, and then when, at the end, in post, you know, he came to me and he said, what do you think about Alice Cooper music? I go, that would be great. I, you know, I actually was in a band at the time when he was in a band called the Naz, we played together, you know, in the 60s, but he was Vincent in those days, he wasn't Alice. And I said, yeah, well, I think we're gonna get him to write a song. And I said, well, can we get other songs too? So we can actually, you know, make an Alice Cooper thing about it. And he goes, yeah, sounds great. So, I mean, those are the kind of, you know, input 
uh, things that, that you know Frank would say, and all very very cool things for the movie. It seems to uh, tie in with Alice Cooper's thing. Didn't he have that movie, The Wraith, back in uh, the eighties as well? Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. So it seems pretty appropriate to have him uh, actually uh, doing almost the soundtrack for the for the movie. That's that's pretty cool. Um, now. Getting back to sometimes tent sets, I noticed that in once again some of the documentaries for some of the other previous Fridays that there have been maybe a lot of disagreements on set or they were kind of miserable places. But I've never seen anyone say anything bad like at all about the movie set and, and the production at all. I mean, it's, it seems like all the actors had a great time doing what they were doing, and uh, and and years have not soured their view. Um, do you? go out your way to kind of foster a real positive uh, work environment where they're at or do you just kind of give them their free reign to do how they ha- what's your directing style when it comes to that sort of yeah, thing I, I really believe much more in you know a, a, a loving supportive trusting you know set than than being a kind of a dictator and you know putting fear into people that you know they, if they don't get it on this next shot they, they're going to look bad you know and, you know cause I'll, I'll, I mean because some directors really do you know, have have this dictatorship. You know, more than anything else. I I love having everybody feel like this is our film. You know, it's not my film, even though I wrote it and I'm directing. It's our film, and that you know, getting their input, letting certain scenes be a little improvised. You know, just letting the you know the actors particularly you know feel the characters, and then you know, same thing with the the cameraman. You know, it's like here's the vision I want. You know, you have any thoughts about that? Well, what if we did this? Oh, that's great. You know, so there's. You know, it is a working uh, team, and if the movie doesn't come out well, at least the experience was great. And because you never know how if they're going to, you know, be perceived when it's all done. I was scared to death of this movie when it was going to come out that the fans wouldn't like, you know, the spin I was putting on it. Um, and it, it was still to this day, thirty something years later, when people, you know, write or I see them at these conventions, it's just great how how much the movie means to so many people. And I think just the fact that the humor and things kind of helped it survive, you know, over the years. And we're still all friends. I mean, all the cast, we, you know, we see each other. We Facebook, I mean, it's, it's like a relationship that's, you know, maintained, you know, three decades now. You can imagine there'd be a lot of fear when you go into an existing IP, you know, when you go into something that fans have known and loved for years and they're asking you, maybe take it in your own direction. Yeah, but that would cause a little bit of a cold sweat on you from time to time. But, uh, yeah, it sounds like at least gave you a good environment to, you know, foster your vision through. So that's great. Um, what scene took the most amount of takes to do in this movie? If you recall. Uh, I'm trying to think if anything was really like we had to do it and do it and do it. Um, you know, I, I'm more, you know, I, I'm, I remember much more of the scenes that you had one cake or that was it, like the motorhome flying, you know, we're going to do that a second time, you know, Jason going to stab uh, Nancy, the Elizabeth character, you know, with one windshield, you know, that was it. And most of the acting scenes and stuff there, you know, everybody was kind of up to speed. We rehearsed things and, you know, kind of worked out the choreography and things, and most stuff went pretty smooth. Um, I mean, later on in my career, I've had actors that just couldn't remember lines, and, you know, you go take after take or just keep rolling and keep feeding the lines and stuff, but that was not the case on this. You know, everything, you know, really, I don't think anything went much beyond three takes, four takes, you know, just me, you know, fiddling, saying, well, what, let's try a little of this or that, mm-hmm. you know. That, that's, it. that's pretty amazing because there's a lot of like physicality in this movie. So yeah, to get it done so quickly, how was uh, how hard was it to shoot on the water out there during the end scenes? Those that, that was actually the lake, for, like the wide shots, and C.J. Graham who was playing Jason. Literally had to go into that that lake, which was cold, filled with snakes and God knows what, um, and then the kind of the distant shot of Tommy and him fighting, you know, was done on the real lake. Then we came back to Los Angeles and we were in the USC Olympic pool, you know, to shoot the actual stuff underwater. Um, and then when Jason gets hit with the propeller, we went to my father's pool in Culver City because he, you know, he was fine with the idea that we were going to chop this stuff and it was going to go all on the pool, all these, you know, blood and guts and stuff. But he was happy as can be to, you know, feel he was part of the movie. So it was like, you know, those three locations to do all the underwater stuff. 
Okay, yeah, you know, and speaking of CJ, a um, couple things. Uh, first off, I think he is criminally underrated as a Jason. Uh, you know, everyone brings up, I won't say other names, but they always bring up one certain person seeing as the definitive yeah. Jason. And I don't think CJ gets brought up enough. I did like Ted White very much as well in four, but uh, CJ, I think he had no acting experience, isn't that correct? None. Yeah, None. He, was, he was a Marine and he performed, you know, in that I give him, you know, a direction and he took it like an order. Yes, sir. And, you know, what sort of evolved out of that was this more kind of Terminator-esque Jason, which I thought really worked because we electrified him. Why not? Does he have to walk around lumbering? You know, it's, it's like, you know, I particularly had him move, of course, with my mind training and stuff, you know, show him something and then he would, you know, do it. And it had such strength and power because, you know, he's, he's one of those guys that and when he commits to something, he commits all the way. And yeah, I, I, I don't know if he's underrated. There's an awful lot of people that, that love him. Um, but, you know, Kane Hodder did so many of the roles uh, in so many of the movies, you know, it kind of was really, you know, his thing for a long mm -hmm. time. And he has a very different way of going about it. And if anybody out there has seen, you know, Friday the 13th, the game, I mean, some of the violence in there, even I'm going, like, I don't know if I can watch this much longer. <laughs> but that was Kane thinking people and, you know, yank, you know, it's all, you know, green screen. But the, the blood and the effects and the stuff is just like, you know, you never could do it in an actual movie, you know, triple X kind of violence mm -hmm. and war. Um, but that's what, you know, he kind of brought to the movie. It was a completely different, you know, style. Um, and each, each of the Jasons, so, you know, were a little bit different just based on, you know, the person and how, you know, how the director kind of shot it, you know, how much you saw. I, I just went to a screening the other night of um, the final chapter. And I thought Joe Zito did a great job on that movie, but it really, you know, he kept Jason very limited, how much you actually saw mm -hmm. on the screen. And uh, so those things were, you know, very effective when you suddenly break in there. And he did a lot of, you know, comedy too with the actors, but it really had virtually no story. You know, it was just, you know, the mother, daughter, and son that, the you know, that lived there, the kids that come, you know, getting stoned, getting, you know, making love and getting killed. And, you know, and I, I wanted to try to have more of a, you know, Tommy had an agenda, he screwed up, Jason now has an agenda to get him and anybody in the way, you know, goes down and then Tommy had to come, had to come up with some, some plan of what he could do to stop him and that was the whole thing of putting him back down in the lake where he first died. So I tried to put a little more of a structure, you know, to it. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't uh, just color by numbers, you know, like a lot of the other ones tended to be, you know, they found their formula, they just stuck to it, and they didn't deviate. So this one had, you had mythology or mythos going on, and you had uh, human conflict. I liked it because all your characters were really fleshed out. Um, they all had personalities. They're all at least given a little bit of screen time, even the tertiary characters, which was, was great, as opposed to a lot of the older ones. They didn't do that very well, and so you're not invested in their, uh, their upcoming demise at all. So I thought that was a, a pretty uh, pretty wise move on your part. My um, hmm? but bringing children in was a big thing too because they, that's, that was the first time that had been done, and it's like you're not going to kill children, are you? Uh, you know, and I had you know some great kids, um, and so some of those moments to me are exactly what a monster movie is supposed to be. That you know, the first thing you do after the monster disappears is look under the bed, you know, and it just things that would get laughs intentionally, um, but still had that kind of innocence of, of why you know these things are are wonderful because they're they're scary and they're you know, kind of part of your childhood nightmares. Yeah, it's kind of the whole Gestalt of thing there. And I mean, you're making a horror movie about a camp counselor, so you expect to see the kids there at some point in these movie series, but you never ever do, before or since, actually. So, um, I won't I won't linger on this movie too much longer. But uh, my favorite scene for Jason in this entire movie is when he's charging into the lake to go after Tommy. Now, he just goes in there so perfectly. Did you have to take more than one take on this shot? Because he looks pretty dry. I don't know if you have to dry him off or. No, that was that was pretty much we you know we went for it and 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 he did it because yeah the, you know to go out change clothes you know dry off it, it was so freaking cold um, you know like the the scene where um, Elizabeth character is in the mud and you know you can actually see steam rising you know off the water because it was so cold um, but that, that, yeah it, it was for 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 me it was great to have somebody like CJ because you knew once. Once you kind of worked it out, it's like, go, you just hope there wasn't something down there that make him slip, you know, 
because you know you can't like test that. You know, you just have to kind of go. Well, I guess we could have the stunt man go out first and and make sure there wasn't anything there. Now that I think of it, mm-hmm. so that kind of practice with that, and then had CJ come in and do it. Lesson learned for the future, right? <laughs> Continue to see stuff, but uh, there's, there's one scene where he's kind of up chest deep and kind of moving out. Was he ever on like a rail or anything out there, or was he just actually walking and looking at robotic chest deep? Yeah. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> yeah. But uh, all right, so. Um, the what was I going to say on that? Oh, well, anyway, we're we're past that now, so we're moving on. So, I uh, recently gave this a real good uh, score. Uh, this movie, uh, just because I thought it worked as more than just a horror movie. It wasn't a it was a Friday Thirteenth movie, but it was also a movie. If you if you get my feeling, I mean, you could go in there without knowing or seeing any other movies, I think, and still have an enjoyable experience. Um, it seems that like. Well, I mean, you had some more uh, movie pictures after this, but were you getting lots of calls after this movie? Just like, hey, you know, I really like what you've done here. Uh, we'd like you to helm this new series, or we'd like you to direct this other big budget. Uh, doesn't have to necessarily be a horror movie. Were you getting a lot of action after this movie? Yeah. Um, well, the, the first one of the first meetings uh, after this was for um, the Freddy the, for the Nightmare on Elm Street Four, and so I went into the meeting at New Line and. You know, they said, well, you know, you did a really great job on this. You know, you know, what are your thoughts about, you know, doing a Freddy movie? And said, I love Freddy. This would be fun. And the humor is already built in and all that. And I said, you know, when do you start shooting? It's like, oh, we already are shooting. Said, what? It's like, oh, yeah, no, we have like four units going. You know, we have the you know, visual effects going. We have, you know, like stunt team and stuff. You know, you mainly be working, you know, with the actors and, you know, Freddy in those scenes. And I was kind of like, you know, I... I, I can't work on something that I don't know what it, you know what is going on because somebody else is doing it. If if we start it together and then kind of you know would you know, give or this is what you do here's the storyboard you you know feel like I had a little more you know control on it. Um, but at that time, yeah, I was kind of in that place where it's like no director has to be you know in the center of the thing to make sure that the, the whole thing kind of ties together with you know one one vision. Um, so that uh, didn't happen. And then it was like a lot of different, um, you know, meetings. But the thing I was really focused on was, was Date with an Angel. I wanted to make this romantic fantasy, you know, with comedy. And uh, went to a party with Frank Mancuso and his father, Frank Sr., who was the head of Paramount. And he introduced me to Dino De Laurentiis. Um, and Dino had a company that he had just started. Um, and said, what would you like to do? Well, you know, you have a horror idea. I said, no, I have a romantic comedy. And he loved it. So that, you know, it was a kind of a quick segue from Friday into Angel. So hypothetically, if you were asked to come back and direct another Friday the 13th movie, would you do it? That, that's a question that's, that's come to me so many times over the years. And basically the answer is yes, if I could come up some, with something that was fresh, something that hasn't been done, something that, you know, hopefully you go, yeah, why haven't they done that? And I did, uh, literally just like six months ago, and wrote this thing and then went, um, wait a minute, and realized that this huge lawsuit is going on and you cannot put anything out. You know, the studios don't even want to see the script. And so I'm sitting there going, I, this is the kind of movie I would love to see as a Friday the 13th fan. Um, just, you know, it's, it's you know, how the location is used, kind of what I've done some new kind of tweaks to Jason, but it's basically kind of in the vein of almost like a sequel to mine, you know, you know almost like, you know, kind of saying that these other things might have happened, but I have my own kind of universe. And the first thing I realized after, you know, hearing that was I have to make it into something else so it's not literally a Friday the 13th and still kind of use the same aspects to it and stuff so that's out there now you know um, so that is there's nothing in there that says Jason hockey mask camp you know all that has to be removed but it still kind of exists in that same same vein it still has those those feelings of like a 80s 90s slasher movie um, with some twists I guess you could maybe call him the creature or something, and he could be camped that around, you know, uh, camp, uh, 
Emerald Lake or something, you know, I guess you could change the things a little bit, at least get the, the script to the door to read it. But uh, you're, 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 you're in the right direction. There was a lot of stuff I just had to find some other clever way to do it that wasn't something that would be uh, any kind of a legal problem. <laughs> But we'll see. I mean, I'll see if, if this pays off because I think when fans see it and they know I did, you know, part six, wrote and directed it, I think they're going to see that, boy, this is really an homage to those movies, if nothing else. And hopefully, it, you know, it works on that level. All right. So I know you're busy, man, so I won't hold you up too much longer here. Um, first of my last questions, isn't that a little bit redundant? Anyway, but um, um, if you were to have – you know, just a random group of people or whoever is watching in the audience, what movie of yours would you want them to watch if you only had one to choose from? I hate to say it kind of depends on the demographics. Um, because I've, I've done some films that I'm incredibly proud of that either are very uncomfortable for people to watch. Um, I did a movie with Andy Garcia called The Unsaid, and that has, you know, so much great for me, cinematic stuff. And Andy's performance is incredible. But as the film goes along and you begin to find out what the main antagonist issue was, it's very creepy and unsettling for a lot of people. And you know, Universal, you know, when they got acquired the movie, just said, I don't think we can put this out. And they ended up you know, doing it on DVD instead, which we were all very frustrated over. Um, but even they felt it was you know, too, too uncomfortable. Yet when Andy and I showed it at the Dovell Film Festival, we got a two minute standing ovation. So, you know, in Europe, they totally embraced it and didn't see this as, as anything, you know, wrong. But that's one kind of film. And then, then I have a lot of these very kind of, you know, romantic or innocent and heartfelt things that, that I feel, you know, it's like having your children, you say, which, you know, if you had to do Sophie's Choice, you had to pick one, <laughs> it's very hard. It's very hard. Um, Friday probably, and I never expected this, was is kind of the, you know, hands down that, you know, anybody who's in the horror genre, you know, likes it and enjoys what it is. But there are certain people that I can't even get to watch it just because of the title. Um, so, and then there's things in New Dark Night that I'm very proud of, but not the whole movie because it was the first movie. So there, to me, there was a lot of things, you know, if I had a chance, I would, you know, redo that in some sort of re-envisioning. Uh, of that, because there's things I know now I didn't know then, you know, that I think I could make it make it better. Um, and then I've had people that, you know, went to passed on surrounded by pictures of the angel from Date with an Angel, because that had such an impact on them and they weren't afraid to die if they were going to go and if it was going to be like that, you know. So, you know, every one of these things has, you know, something about it that I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm glad I made that. You know, I just remembered my question now, the one I forgot, the Friday the 13th, and here I am back on that again. Uh, real, real briefly, how much footage do you think the MPA, MPA had you cut out of that movie? I mean, how, how bad was it because of it? It's actually, I mean, I guess if you actually put all the frames together, it's really not a lot, a lot. Um, but they just chopped off, you know, we had nine screenings uh, for them. And it was, you know, take few more frames off of this, trim this down, you know, you can't see the triple, triple decapitation actually happen. We see it goes through and then we see the fall, you know, and that was an amazing effect. Um, when the guy's head is crushed, you actually see the skull kind of crack up and crack open and a bit of brain matter come up and, you know, that we didn't get to have in there. But again, they're small pieces and that's been the problem of trying to figure out where all those small pieces are today if we wanted to try to, you know, put them back into the film. And so far, no one has found them. Yeah, most of that footage seems to have been either lost or destroyed, and most of those older ones, um, I, it's got to be horribly frustrating for the effects people, knowing they're going to go and do a Friday movie, and they're going to be asked to do all kinds of cool stuff, and they have to know that probably three-fourths of what they're actually going to do is going to get cut, you know? <laughs> but, the thing, but the thing that is the most strange is that one scene where Jason has the sheriff and he bends him backwards, I mean, they picked on that like you can't believe and there's no blood. There's no gore. It's just the idea of bending somebody backwards and hearing this, you know, kind of sound happen. And it bothered, you know, the hell out of them. And, and I think that was like sort of like the last frontier was trying to get that scene acceptable, you know, in, in terms of how much it needed to be cut down. So it's not always just the gore. Um, it's, it's the cumulative effect, you know, that it can have when they, they're sitting there going, OK, enough, 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 you know.
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not a gore fiend, so I, I don't think you have to have excessive amounts of gore to have an effective kill scene or anything like that. In fact, my favorite my my favorite actual kill in the entire series is in your movie, and that's uh, when Nikki gets her face pushed through the Winnebago wall. I just brilliant, brilliantly shot, brilliantly edited. I love that. You'll probably see that in my review too. But even the sound effects are good. So, but yeah, it doesn't always have to be bloody. But uh, all right, so. I know you're out there touring with your band right now. Is there anything else you want to plug or tell people about out there that you're currently involved in? Well, just hopefully, you know, uh, look for the movie. You know, that, that I, I, I wish I had more details on it that, that I wrote that, you know, hope we can get into production. Um, that and the book's out there, you know, uh, sometime um, strange idea of entertainment that, you know, I don't make any money off of it, but I, if you really want to get a lot of details about the strange life of Tom McLaughlin, it's all in there. Joe did an amazing job with the questions and pictures and things that are in there. And then the band, yeah, the Sloss, we are, you know, go on YouTube and put the Sloss and you'll get cute little furry animals and you'll get us. So, you know, it's that's been, you know, such a remarkable thing to happen at this point in our lives that, it, you know, we just keep doing it, figuring, you know, if we drop doing this, that'll be cool. You know, it's like just rock till we drop. You know? So that those are the you know, kind of the main things I'm focusing on now. All right. Well, it's not here in a great place right now, and uh, we wish you all the best. Uh, I really want to give you my sincerest, heartfelt uh, thanks for, for coming on and talking with me a little bit today. I know you're probably inundated with uh, requests for these kind of things, but uh, so it's, it's very much appreciated. Um, you're asking. All right, so uh, once again, I want to make sure everyone gets out there and, and watch a few films out of, this, uh, out of this man's library. You might be pleasantly surprised. Uh, like I said, there's a little bit of um, a variety out there for everybody. So if they're not into horror movies, like he said, you might find a rom-com out there that he's directed for you. So uh, he also did a lot, ton of TV stuff, and uh, basically he's a real renaissance man. I'll say that much. So um, anyway, unless you had anything further to add, Tom, I'm going to go ahead and let you go back to your busy day. All right. Um, yeah, just, you know, guys, keep your dream. Keep it alive, you know, but don't don't give it up because you, know, you never know when in your life the things that you really desire to have passion for will actually happen, but they do. You just have to, you know, keep the faith. All right, words to live by. So, all right, I appreciate everyone for tuning in, and stay tuned for the next interview in my series. Uh, I don't have a name announced yet, but uh, I'll announce it when I do. So until next time, this is Genome and Tom McLaughlin, out.